Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. Again, and I'm making this sort of the norm. I am, uh, I'm gonna do a wrist check right away. Today I'm wearing a watch that's somewhat sentimental to Ian. You've seen this watch before, I showed it to you. It's my white gold piece serial Daytona, a watch that's arguably the rarest modern day Daytona out there. They made the Daytonas on the strap in very little amounts to begin with because they weren't the most popular, but as a result, they made the least of these. And the reason it's sentimental to Ian, Ian just got married recently. And when he came to me and said, hey, I wanna wear something nice for my wedding. I said, well, pick, you got some choices. And he picked this watch to wear. And maybe you can pop in a picture with this watch. You have one? Anyway, but that's, that's what I'm wearing. But in either case, congrats to Ian, and I'm sure you will all uh, comment below just the same. Uh, let's move on to some questions. Question via email from Mark MC. Hey, Roman, great fan of your channel. Glad to see the recent growth on it, and you're so worthy of it. Personally, I love the way you talk about such stratospheric watches to me on a, such a down-to-earth basis. My question, Roman, have you ever sold a Chinese watch? If not, do you think in your lifetime that the Chinese will ever break through the high-end market? Perhaps they already have. I'm not aware of it. What are your thoughts about the Chinese watch industry now and for the future? Best Mark MC. Of course, I didn't read the whole email. There's some personal things that uh, Mark uh, mentioned and I did read that, Mark, just so you understand. Uh, but let's talk about your question. The Chinese are not just uh, making high-end watches. The Chinese are making high-end a lot of things. They're breaking into the wine industry. They're breaking into the fashion industry. And they are trying to do their best to break into the watch industry, but this isn't something that I don't think ever is going to happen. Uh, French wine, right? French has always been the authority on wine. French has always been the best wine, the best champagnes. Ah, the French champagne. Let's talk about watches. Who is it that's known for watches? Yes, there are some German watches that are like Langenstein that are just as high-end as Swiss, but the minute you ask somebody about high-end watch country, Switzerland. The minute you ask someone for best wine in the world, they'll tell you France. Cars, Italy, Germany, right? Best basketball player ever, Michael Jordan. Best uh, boxer ever, Mike Tyson. Again, all arguable, right, or Muhammad Ali. All arguable, but these are the things that just sort of roll off the top of your tongue. And the Chinese watch manufacturing is not gonna be the first, second, or even third thing that's gonna roll off the tongue of somebody when they're thinking high-end watches. And that's just the way it goes for any industry out there. Uh, and unfortunately, as much as the Chinese will try to push it, they will never sort of reach number one. That's why, you know, you have Rolex and there's never gonna be another Rolex. Uh, just like there's never going to be another Champagne. Many other countries in the world make what's called sparkling wine because it's obviously not from the Champagne regions, but there's only one Champagne, friends, and the Champagne from there will always be the champagne. It will always be considered to be best. It's always been celebrated for its excellence. If you're gonna think champagne, you're gonna think French. And that's just the way it is. There are high-end Chinese manufacturer watch brands out there, but they're just not recognized worldwide and don't roll off the tip of somebody's tongue. So I hope that answers your question. Next question from Ryan Kelly. Roman, great show, long time viewer, thank you. I had a question regarding assessing the quality of bracelets. Can you explain how and why some bracelets hold their quality while others begin to stretch? More specifically, why do some watch bands stretch over time while others don't? Is it due to oxidation of metals, the incorrect fit of a watch, or other reasons? Thanks for your help. Very simple question, Brian. It's due to the flaw of the design of the bracelet. Uh, if you look at some of the older Rolexes, they tend to turn into rainbows, and that's due to the design of the watch. Multiple links that are held by one center link, and that's all that's holding them in place, right? It's sort of like this concept right here, right? And all you have is this middle piece, and it's always moving and flexing, right? Over time, Rolex has improved greatly on their bracelets. They now have these ceramic tubes that go between the screw and the link, giving it that extra strength for the stuff not to stretch. So if you take a much older Rolex versus a much newer Rolex, and let's say they're both new old stock, the quality of this bracelet will be much nicer than of the other. Look at some of the old rivet style bracelets from some of these vintage Rolex, like the, like the one I had on my Pepsi GMT, right? That's an extremely flimsy bracelet, and that's due to the design. Nothing to do with oxidation. Obviously, wear over time, define time define an error. You know, if you look at uh, some of the older braces, they'll wear out much faster than some of the newer braces because they're now they're made better, they've learned over time. But for the most part, it's due to the flaw of the original design. I'm not so sure that going back 50, 60, 70 years, watches weren't as popular, weren't as hot, and weren't as expensive, per se. 
I don't think they look to the future in regards to these things lasting that long. You know, my rivet bracelet on my Pepsi GMT is 60 years old. You know, I don't know if at the time Rolex made that, it was meant to last 60 years, or maybe it was meant for the bracelet to be replaced because it was fairly inexpensive back then, considering the whole watch was a couple hundred bucks, right? So yeah, design flaw, not uh, oxidation or excessive wear. Next question from David Bidener. Roman, in this video, you mentioned you had a Vacheron pocket watch that was difficult to sell despite Vacheron being a big brand. With regards to modern watches, I'm interested to know how Vacheron is viewed by yourself and the industry in general. We all know Vacheron is considered to be one of the holy trinity along with AP and Paddock, but really when people talk about big brand names, they mean Rolex, AP, Paddock. Vacheron seems to be off on its own somewhere, thanks David. So all the stuff is here, say Holy Trinity, big brands, it's all a matter of opinion of the general public and it's really about trends, right? Uh, right now people don't just talk about Rolex AP and Paddock, there's Richard Mille who's a fairly newcomer is in that mix. But if you ask a lot of the collectors, a lot of them will say Vacheron. It's, it really, it's really a matter of opinion. Vacheron is a great brand. I should do a history video on Vacheron, grab a few and uh, do one of those videos, much like I did for AP, but I won't get into that. Vacheron is a great brand and yes, many still consider it part of the holy trinity, right? Except now it's not as popular as it was. Go back three, four years, five years, you couldn't find a Vacheron. Why? Because the Asian market was buying that Vacheron. The Asian market was so hot. You could wholesale uh, Vacheron constantly to 20% off retail. Authorized dealers in the United States were getting allocated five to 10 pieces of no matter what Vacheron. Sort of think of uh, the Nautilus line from Paddock today. This is what Vacheron was like, and it wasn't just for overseas. Or any, it was for every single model in their lineup. They were hot. Piaget was just as hot at the same time, and it was extremely popular in the Asian market. One of the Piaget boutiques in Hong Kong collectively sold more Piagets than all the other boutiques combined worldwide. That's how crazy the market was, and same kind of went for Vacheron. And right now, it's just not as hot. The, the clunker offshores that I absolutely love, I couldn't give one away for five, six thousand dollars, you know, 15 years ago. And today, you'd be hard pressed to get one at a discount period, and the new ones, and most of them are trading over list, and the Royal Oaks, trends change, and that doesn't make Vacheron a bad brand. Vacheron still has the same quality. Vacheron still has some beautiful models. Vacheron still has quality watchmaking. It's still part of that holy trinity in most people's eyes. It's just right now, it's not as popular as this next guy. But remember I told you guys, it all goes like this, you know? With the exception of Rolex. Rolex is always on the top. So I don't even want to put Rolex in that. And right now, outside of Rolex, it's about Paddock, but it's really not about Paddock. Vacheron was most successful because with Paddock, it's really about the Nautiluses and the Aquanauts. Their high-end stuff is dead in the water. It discounts, it discounts well. Any annual calendar, anything dressy from Paddock right now is eh. Aquanauts, Nautiluses, that's all. And those have come down a little bit, right? AP, arguably can say the same thing. Royal Oak, Royal Oak Offshore. But then again, if you look at percentage of the branded lines right now, they have the Royal Oak, they have the Royal Oak Offshore, they have the Millinery, they have the Code 1159, right? Royal Oak and Royal Oak Offshore makes up half of their lineup. So they're doing well when it comes to that. Richard Mille is probably the only one I can say where well, everything sells, especially including ladies' pieces. That's how you know you're doing really, really well when your ladies' pieces are selling at full pop and over list because again, ladies' pieces sell much less versus men's pieces. We talked about this before. So don't worry about Vacheron. I'm certainly not worried. They've been around for a long time. And Vacheron was born in 1755. They become part of the Richmond Group in 1996. Neither Vacheron nor the Richmond Group is going anywhere. It's a brand that's here to stay. If you love Vacheron, get out there, buy them, enjoy them. Don't worry about what the public has to say or whether or not it's in the circle of trust or out of the circle of trust or the Holy Trinity, whatever you want to call it. Hope that answers your question. Very good question from Daniel, CEO. Hi, Roman. Great content. As usual, I have watched most of your videos and wanted to thank you for sharing your knowledge. I was wondering where you can tell me about white gold watches. Why are they relatively unpopular compared to steel? yellow rose gold model could that be due to the weight of the watch or the look or other reasons i'll tell you the main reason and probably the only reason when people buy fancy things cars watches clothes jewelry big houses human nature wants to show it off very difficult to stay humble but you can still stay humble to show things off in a, in a very simple manner. But for the most part, when people are buying gold watches, they want people, to, they want others to know that it's a gold watch and they want to see a gold watch on their wrist. I'm wearing a white gold Daytona. And then from here, you can very well just say, just say, hey, Roman, you're wearing a steel Daytona, right? There's still little nuances and difference that you have to look close for to know that it's actually white gold, yellow gold, rose gold. As far as yellow gold and rose gold, this is where you're able to really say, hey, I am wearing a gold watch. I'm wearing a gold Rolex AP or whatever it might be because you can tell from afar that you're wearing a big gold watch. So if I took 10 guys 
and I gave him the same gold Rolex, yellow gold or white gold, and asked the 10 a question, which would you rather wear? I think probably eight out of 10 will pick gold. Why? Because they want to wear a gold Rolex. A lot of guys are also saying, I don't want to wear white gold because it looks like steel, which is more to my point, right? And those that say, well, listen, I want a white metal watch. Why am I going to waste my money on white gold and pay three times the price when I can get seemingly the same watch in stainless steel that looks more or less the same? Most manufacturers will differ the models out. You'll be able to tell what's white gold, what's not white gold, right? For example, they won't manufacture a stainless steel counterpart to the same watch that's manufactured in white gold. But there are some instances where white gold looks pretty much the same as the stainless steel. And this is where the guys will say, well, I'm going to waste that money. I can just buy stainless steel if I want a white metal. Or some guys will get even snooty and say, you know what, I want to stay humble, but I want an expensive watch. Let me go the platinum route. But even then, majority of the companies out there will make these subtle changes where those that know will know it's a platinum watch, like blue dials, blue straps. If you're wearing a white metal blue dial Rolex, President, odds are it's a platinum watch, right? The easiest answer I can give you is people that buy expensive gold watches, they want to see a gold watch, and they also want others to see that it's a gold watch. And with white gold, that's not the case, because most people will think it's a steel watch. Hope that answers your question. Here's a good one from Vanille Parrick, whose questions I have answered in the past. I like this. Uh, Roman, list a few of your hits and misses. Watches, deals that you regret financially, and the times you hit a jackpot like a top three hits and misses. I enjoy your videos and a thumbs up for Ian. Thank you for Neil. I can give you uh, top three hits, and financially, the biggest hit came through was when I uh, when I sold uh, a first highly complicated watch. A watch that I never had in stock. I couldn't afford to have in stock. It was a Skyline Terbion that at the time traded to the tune of a million three fifty. That was the first time I made over a hundred thousand dollars on any single transaction. And it wasn't the current Skyline Terbion. It was it was it was his predecessor in platinum. And it was a back-to-back -back hit. I sold one in platinum and I sold one in uh, rose gold back-to-back. -back. Because once I sold the platinum, I, I had enough rapport to deliver these big pieces. I went and sold the rose gold. And I tell you, my knees were shaking because it was quite the scare. It was the first huge, humongous deal I've ever done. Both myself and Art, that was a partner with me at the time, we were both somewhat scared. That's number one. The second hit, it's not just a financial hit, but it's who I got to meet. I managed to sell a watch to a very... Uh, well-off individual financially. He was number 600 something on the Forbes list, which makes him a billionaire. And it was the experience that I got while I was selling the watch of the person who is worth buku dollars and how humble that individual was and how nice he was. I, I met people that he could afford a hundred or a thousand times over that had a little bit of money that like, like, acted like complete fools buying an expensive watch and showing off. And it was the experience of meeting such a smart individual, an individual that has achieve so much in his life and not just financially. And uh, that's another big hit, is having to meet the people behind these expensive items. And never, never mind the fact that I made 50,000 on that watch, let's say. And I don't remember exactly how much I made. But it was the fact that I got, I got to meet interesting people. And until this day, with every transaction, for the most part, meet people that are more well off than I am. And it's interesting to talk to them, to see how they are, talk about their business, their success, and feed off of that, you learn off of that, right? A miss in that same row of high-end paddock was a paddock 5104, right? It's that skeleton minute repeater they came out with a while back. Today trades, uh, I think we sold the last one around 600,000, right? At the time it came out, and that's about what it retails for, at the time it came out, that watch was trading at a million too. This was right before the crisis of 08 and everything was through the roof. Diamonds, watches, paddocks, limited APs, and high-end paddocks were specifically hot at the time. A 3939, which is a billionaire's, they call it a billionaire's paddock, and the reason for that is because this tiny little 36 millimeter thing, minute repeater, a turbion that you can't really tell that that's an expensive watch, it looks like a $2 watch, very incognito. That thing was trading at five to $600,000. Today they're at 250 to 300, just to put it in perspective. But every minute repeater or any uh, application piece that I talked about in the pass from paddock was trading almost a double its retail value because people were buying those things up. A lot of people in Russia were buying them up. Uh, there was a lot of money in Russia at the time. A lot of places in the world were booming. The economy was great. It was at its peak, remember, right before the crisis. It happened here in the U.S. Skyman Turbion and Platinum at the time traded as high as a million six fifty, you know, which was $650,000 over its list value more. I think it was 900000 list at the time. So 5104P just hits the market. I get a phone call from a guy in Moscow who I know of. Uh, he has heard of us, and again, we weren't really that big at the time. Again, a piece we could not afford, me and Arthur. And he goes, uh, I need a 5104. I'm like, I know such and such, they know you. They said, you're a good guy, can you find me a 5104P? I'm like, sure, no problem, give me a day or so. Like I had any idea where to get this watch. Called a few dealers that I know deal with this kind of stuff. Lo and behold, I found one for a million one fifty. 
And I called him up. I'm like, listen, I found one, but the price is ridiculous. It's, it's a damn near double retail. It's double retail. You know, I was like, quarter of a million, 250. He goes, I want it. I don't care. My client needs it. It doesn't matter what the price is. So I'm send it. I'm like, okay, well, send me a wire. I'm not in a position to take those kind of risks. No problem. Gets the money over in a few days. I go out, I buy the watch, I send it to him, he's happy. As the watch is still en route to him, calls me again, it's like, I need another one. I'm like, okay, now I know it's Mission Impossible, so I was like, there's no way. This is probably the one of three that have, has come out so far. I can't think of another one. He goes, just try. I'm like, okay. Call the same person, I said, is, what are the odds of me getting another one of these? He says, mm, there's one guy that has one, he's a billionaire, he got the watch from Paddock. I don't, he doesn't really obviously care for profit on this watch, even if he makes $500,000. But nevertheless, let me ask him, maybe he's not that in love with the watch. Lo and behold, I get lucky, the person says, yeah, I do want to sell it. And listen, just because you're a billionaire, who doesn't want to take a half a million dollar profit on anything, all right? Uh, again, same price, a million 150. I sell the watch to a guy for a million 250. Uh, and I tell him, okay, I need to give a deposit to this person. Go ahead and send me a deposit of 250. I'll go put that deposit down so I can secure the watch. The guy goes, it's not a problem, but I'm, only, I'm out of town. I'm only going to be able to send you that wire in a week's time. Do me a favor. Put up your own deposit. Don't worry. I got it. And I remember, I've never even seen this guy in person. I know of him. I know he's a, he's a big guy in Moscow. I, I, and I technically wanted to do business with him because I knew this guy was huge and he could, and he could certainly buy a lot and he had a lot of money to spend. This is something that I wanted to uh, really achieve, this, doing business with this guy. But I broke one golden rule. You know, I got greedy and I, and, and I overlooked what would happen if this guy doesn't pay me? And uh, in our business, I told you guys before, it's all about, you know, your word. Your word is key. And oftentimes you get guys in our business that are so big and they get so big, they don't give a shit what their word means because everybody and their mother is, in line, is lining up to do business with them, right? Which was the case with this guy. And uh, I said, okay, well, listen, this guy just sent me a million 150 for the one watch that I delivered him. Obviously he's gonna, you know, he's gonna send me a deposit in a couple of days. I, just, I knew that he was traveling for a fact. And it's like, okay. I went and gave a $200,000 deposit towards this watch, which was a huge chunk of change for us at the time. A few days go by, I called the guy, I'm like, hey, where's my deposit? I really need to, uh, I need to start buying out the watch. Send me the, send, when are you sending the wire? He goes, oh, you know what? I'm not gonna buy that watch. I'm like, why? I'm like, it's like my client changed his mind. He doesn't want it anymore. I'm like, okay, well, how's that my problem? You committed to me on the watch. He's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't really care in a nutshell. Tell me to go scratch. Long story short, I went back to the other guy. I'm not the guy not to keep my word. And I ended up losing a $200,000 deposit, which was a humongous hit for me at the time. Uh, we weren't really, really happy about it. Theoretically, I was supposed to buy out that watch, but the guy I was dealing with kind of knew that I wasn't going to be able to. But lo and behold, the deposit was kept and I was out $200,000. And that was probably the biggest hit that I took in that same realm of selling these high-end pieces. Other hits. Um, Arthur was bitching and moaning at me when, I, when we just first started out. I would take $5,000, $10,000 sometimes and buy some vintage rolls and put it away in the safe, buy it and put it away in the safe. And he would go, why? You tell us that, listen, at the end of the day, you, you know, it's not something that we feel, let's say, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, an extra five, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And I was doing safe things. I was buying steel Daytonas. I was buying steel subs. I was buying vintage pieces that weren't already somewhat old but still reasonably priced. I was trying to stick to that under, up to that $10,000 price range so it wasn't felt from the bottom line. And lo and behold, when I put away 50 of those things and sold them all last year, the profits realized were great. And again, it goes against what I always say, watch is not an investment, but again, being in an industry, they are. I know what the hell I'm doing, I know what the hell I'm buying. Of course, when I went and sold them, and I always, I guys give you all, all new, I always give you the same example, uh, A serial and P serial Daytonas, which cost me under 10,000 for each watch, and I sold them collectively for $160,000 on a $40,000 investment, that's not so bad, right? But again, I knew when to sell them uh, and whom to sell it to. So that's another big hit that uh, I, I guess I made. But within that same collection, I mentioned this earlier, is you know, I bought a bunch of things that weren't winners that I didn't make any money on. But overall, I did extremely, extremely well. Recent big hits, the new Sky Moon Turbion with the blue dial sold for almost $2.6 million. Uh, I'm not gonna mention how much money I made, but uh, I made a decent chunk of money. Perpetual Mini Repeater Paddock, another one for $600,000. So we do tend to sell big pieces. I often show you guys big pieces on my show because that's what we specialize, we sell high-end pieces. And it all goes back and started with the sale of my very first Skyman Turbion and a couple of mini repeaters from Paddock where I got comfortable in buying and selling those pieces. 
And at the end of the day, you have to have balls to do that because you can't get stuck. You can get stuck for a deposit like I did. You can get stuck with a watch that you can't sell. That watch can drop in value drastically. For the most part, I'm extremely careful with the really big pieces. And I, then I have plenty of pieces in stock that are 100000 to 200000 to 300000 some upwards of a half a million dollars, but I don't have a slew of them. I don't have... 20 or 30 pieces that are half a million dollars and up. For the most part, those are the pieces that I buy with a customer in mind. Oftentimes it's already pre-sold or oftentimes it's offered to me and I have the client base to re-offer the watch to where I'm virtually not taking any risk. Of course, when you're not taking any risk, you usually end up making less margins when you sort of flip in that expensive timepiece. So from time to time, when a deal is right, I do stock these pieces, I hold them in stock, I wait for the right client, for the right margins, and rather than wholesale them, I'll retail them to a retail client. And again, there's a lot of value behind it, and that's the rapport that you build. When somebody needs a tourbillon, anywhere from 20,000 to a half a million dollars, I usually get the phone call because I have the stuff. I'm not sure if I gave you three or more hits or misses, but uh, I think that's the best I'm gonna do for the moment, just off the top of my head, uh, Finu. So I hope that somewhat answers your question. Well, guys, that's it for me for today. Hope you enjoyed today's Q&A. As usual, like, share, subscribe, comment below with new questions. I will get to them as soon as I possibly can. And just wanted to say again for uh, tuning in week in and week out. Some of my episodes have been running a little long, some of of us shorter. Quick thanks once in a while. I know I always say thank you for watching and things of that nature, but really thank you. It's really motivating me to continue doing what I'm doing. Uh, It's really motivating for me to get behind the camera every week, answer all your questions, show you watches, show you my life, my vlogs, my travel. Uh, The production value has been going up and up and up because I'm investing more time, money, and effort into these things as my audience grows and as I get that positive feedback from you guys. So thank you very much once again, and I'll see you next Tuesday.